Uh, now, just a quick recap of last week. Part one last week was the promises in Eden uh, and Abraham. And uh, probably the most important thing we saw was this theme of a seed or an offspring uh, that was uh, pointing forward to Jesus as Savior. We saw that in, in uh, the promise in Eden, uh, which we will look at in more detail next week, God willing. Uh, the second set of promises were to Abraham and ultimately to his wife, Sarah, as well. The, the seed that they would produce, the son they would produce, Isaac. Uh, the promises were, were uh, reiterated to Isaac and then Jacob and so on. And, and we saw in that that Abraham was promised land. Uh, he was promised to have, have land forever. He didn't receive that promise in this life. And so we're awaiting some future fulfillment of that. Um, so that was... Uh, that was last week, brief recap. Uh, this week, we're looking at the promises to David and their fulfillment in Jesus. We're gonna see how these uh, promises start to come together and connect to each other. Uh, next week, we'll look at uh, how they even more relate to Jesus and specifically that promise uh, in, in Eden. And then uh, our fourth week will be how they relate to the kingdom of God on earth and how we participate in them as well. And so really last week and this week lay the groundwork for going in and digging deeper and looking more in more depth uh, in the next two weeks. Uh, here's just a reminder of our, our seminar goals. Um, it's important to keep these in mind. You know, we're looking at this theme of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. We mentioned last week that, uh, you know, the first time sin appeared in the world in Genesis 3, uh, God also had a plan for salvation and sending a savior. And that runs throughout the, uh, throughout the, uh, the Bible. Bible. This idea of, of two seeds, a seed of the serpent and a seed of the woman, runs throughout Scripture. So we're really laying some groundwork for some um, fundamental understanding of the, the big picture of what the Bible message, the gospel message, is all about. Uh, and so that Old and New Testament work together. Uh, they reveal the love of God, which is obviously a theme in Scripture from cover to cover, and ultimately how we can take part in those things. This was our focus verse. And we'll mention this every week because it's important to see this uh, in, in 2 Peter 1, verse 4, where, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So we're looking at this theme of promises. And, and the importance of those is that they help us to, to overcome, uh, to, to escape the, 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 the lust that so naturally comes to us in our human nature and that we ultimately might um, partake of divine nature. So part two, the promises to David and their fulfillment in Jesus. Now, before we get to, um, to, to David, we're gonna sneak in one little thing here um, that comes uh, after Eden, but before Abraham, and that is this little incident called the flood. You might remember that about 1400 years after uh, creation, uh, God was upset with the, the world uh, and that the, the seed of the, the serpent, the descendants of Cain and his family, um, began to multiply and, and, and be, be uh, persecutors of others. And it got to the point where in the time of Noah, uh, man's wickedness was so great uh, that God had to kind of do a reboot and, uh, and work through Noah and his family to start over again. And so we have this verse here in Genesis 6, verses 11 to 13. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, in earlier in chapter 6, we saw that the, the, the sons of God, those were the descendants of, of Seth, uh, those who were the, the seed of the woman, if you will, the faithful ones, they began to intermingle and intermarry with what, who are called the daughters of men. That's the, the seed of the serpent, the descendants of Cain. Um, and, and this brought about the situation that God refers to here, that uh, it, was, it, was, it was too far gone, and, and only Noah was, was uh, found righteous before God and found grace in, in God's sight. Um, and... Uh, so he, he was going to, to restart, if you will. Uh, a reminder also, it's interesting to note that Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, in the days of the Son of Man. That is when he's going to return. So some of this language we read today might remind us quite a bit of our world 
And we're waiting for that time where God will intervene once again. Now, after the flood uh, and after the world was uh, was cleansed and, and Noah and his family were saved, uh, this is this covenant or this promise. Remember, promise, covenant, these are, are words that we need to, to look for in, in biblical language. <clears throat> so here in Genesis 9, verses 9 to 11, uh, God says, And I, that is the Lord, behold, I establish my covenant with you, Noah, and with your seed. So here's this word seed, your family, your offspring um after you <clears throat> and with every living creature that is that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and of the beast of the earth with you uh, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth and i will establish my covenant with you and and here was the covenant here's the promise god made neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth and so this is very important that uh, what we see here is that in this this covenant this promise to noah and, and his family and therefore to all generations right down to today we have this prominence promise of the permanence of the earth <clears throat> and it was confirmed by a covenant that god made with everyone with with the earth with all people with all flesh all animals and it symbolized of course of course in the rainbow that god put in the sky after the flood and so just that little connection there um, this, this promise isn't as deep and connected in terms of the promises in Eden and to Abraham, and we'll see to David, but it is related. There is some, some common language. Um, <clears throat> so now, getting back to our main theme for today, which is the promises to David. First of all, we want to see that there was something very important promised um, to Judah. First of all, the tribe of Judah. Now, Genesis 49, here we have verse 10 on the screen. Um, once again, you may want to have your Bible open and, and do some markings. Uh, I also remind you that um, these slides will be available uh, for download um, and some notes, some summary notes, as well as this video uh, that we're pre-recording here uh, for, for this week. But nonetheless, it's good to have your Bibles open. It's good to be making notes uh, as we go along. Now, in Genesis 49, uh, Jacob who was also named Israel, is dying. And in his last uh, words, he gives promises or, or blessings upon all, each of his sons. And uh, one of his sons was Judah. And of Judah, uh, Jacob said the following, and we believe moved by inspiration, it was prophetic. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and that's some biblical language for the Messiah, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, this is significant. The, the graphic there is, is of a lion, because the tribe of Judah was represented by the, 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 the figure of a lion. But he's also, a, he's, got, he's, a, he's got a crown, because the scepter, the ruling, um, the, the ruling symbol of a scepter or a crown will be with Judah and a lawgiver. Um, and this would be there. So the tribe of Judah was made a special promise. You'll remember that in the promises to Abraham, it was spoke of kings. Sarah was told that kings would come from her. And so this is through the tribe of Judah, um, this, this kingship would be. Um, but also a lawgiver and ultimately a messiah. So we see some connections back through this seed to Abraham and to the promises made in Eden. Now, we'll focus now on, on David. And David was of the tribe of Judah. And David was actually their second king. Um, and uh, we're, we don't have time to go into all that history, but Saul was the first king, the people's choice. He was a tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he, he looked like a good king from the, the outward perspective. He, he was tall and, and uh, a good warrior and so on. Um, David was God's choice, the next king, to replace Saul. He was a man after God's own heart. Uh, and, and he came from the tribe of Judah. So nearly a thousand years after Abraham, uh, his descendants became the nation of Israel. This was a partial fulfillment of, of many of the promises made to him. There would be a king. They would have land and territory. Um, th these things applied uh, to the promises made to Abraham. Of course, they weren't the forever promises, but they are important. They become a kingdom in the land of promise, and God made further promises, momentous promises, to the, their first king from the tribe of Judah, uh, and said the following in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
And this is a chapter we're going to, the next few slides come from, from this uh, chapter. So again, maybe open up your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And this is what the Lord told David through his prophet Nathan. Uh, so in verse, starting in verse 11 of 2 Samuel 7, the Lord tells thee, David, that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Okay, so some common words. That's what we're looking for, effective Bible reading. We're looking for echoes. We're looking for, for common words. So this word seed, again, your version may say offspring, uh, is a connecting right back to Abraham's promises and the promises in Eden. And it's talking about a kingdom. Now, this first part here says, he, God, will make thee, David, and house. Uh, th this may have been a little odd to David um, because the context of this chapter in 2 Samuel 7 is that David goes to the prophet Nathan and says that he'd like to build God a house. He says, you know, God has been only in tents or ever since the days of the wilderness. He's just been dwelling in tents. Um, but I'd like to make a house for him. And in his response, God says, well, David, it's actually me that's going to build you a house. Um, so that, that's a bit, a bit strange and David might've pondered that, uh, but we're going to see as the prophet continued, it became obvious that the Lord had in mind a different kind of house. You know, one was a physical building and the, and the image here is of, uh, an artist's depiction of what Solomon's temple may have looked like. We know that David's son Solomon did build a temple and this is what David wanted. And God said to David, you can't do it because of the bloodshed on your hands, but your son will build this, this temple. But the house that God is spe uh, speaking of is, is really a, a dynasty, a, a, a succession of kings. It's, it's, a much, it's not a physical house. It's, it's a house of, of people. It's, it's a holy temple, a spiritual temple. But we'll see that as we move on here. <clears throat> so this is what God said. He, that is the, the seed, David's seed, his son, will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Now, the interesting thing is if we stopped here in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, you know, this could be this could be David's son Solomon. He was the next king. We're going to look at him in a little more detail uh, just in a few, a few minutes. He was set up as king over Israel, and he built a temple. So is that all these promises are about? Remember, even the promises in Eden had a direct fulfillment. We saw it in Cain and Abel. Uh, Abraham's promises had a direct fulfillment. We saw that his children did multiply, did become a great nation, and did inherit the land. But the bigger sense of the promises were long-term. So what does this promise go on to say? Forever. So it says, I will establish the kingdom, the throne of his kingdom, forever in second samuel chapter 7. do you see it there you might want to color in that word color in the word seed color in the word forever this is giving us connections between abraham's promises and david's promises and then in verses 13 and 14 of second samuel chapter 7 something remarkable is said god says i the lord will be his father the seed and he shall be my son and your, that is David's house, right? This dynasty, this, this big picture thing, and your kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Now, this is just remarkable. And, and, and we're going to unpack this a little bit even more um, in week four. But what do we got here? So this is not only going to be the son of David, it's going to be the son of God. And we're going to see this isn't in just some general sense, like that we're all children of God, but something much more personal, much more real, shall we say. Um, and as reiterated that this kingdom would go on forever and that David would be there. Now, now just remember this promise started with God saying, when you die, David, I'm going to set up your son over you and he's going to build me a house. Great. That's what Solomon did. But then whatever this is about here in verse 13 and 14 is something much bigger than that. Because it, the kingdom isn't only going to be established forever. Your dynasty isn't only going to go on forever. But you're going to see it, David. And, and we see that this is um, the connection then back to Abraham, right? He was going to inherit the land forever. Not just his descendants, 
not just the seed singular, but Abraham was going to inherit it forever. And he hasn't even got a piece of it yet. We saw that last week. Okay, same thing here. David, your kingdom's going to last forever. Great, but I'm going to die in a few years. No, no, no. You're going to be there, David. This, this singular seed, not just the plural seed, the many descendants you'll have, but the singular seed, Shiloh, Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to reign forever, and you're going to be there with him. And that's remarkable. And again, we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more uh, in a couple of weeks' times. Now, David understood the short-term fulfillment of this prophecy because uh, in, in 1 Chronicles 28, right at the end of his life, as, as he was knew his, his days were, were numbered and there was only a few left, he said the following, And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, says David, he, God, has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So David saw in Solomon this fulfillment that of as many sons, one was chosen to be the king. And notice that it's the kingdom of God on earth. So there was a kingdom of God on earth at one time. And this is a picture here, an artist's rendition of perhaps the Queen of Sheba would have been, would have been like when she came to visit Solomon. Uh, the description of Solomon's kingdom is, is remarkable. He built a temple. Uh, he, all his servants were happy. People came from all over the world to visit him and bring him gifts. These are all pictures of what it's going to be like when Jesus sets up God's kingdom on earth. But this was just a picture of it, just a cameo, if you will, just a type of what it's going to be like. But David understood this was part of the, of the, of the promises that God had made to him. Um, but as we see here, David's kingdom did not last forever. And so like the promise to Abraham, we await their future fulfillment. And this is typical, effective Bible reading. This is typical of biblical prophecies. They did have some connection to the, to the then and there when the prophecy was given, some sort of immediate fulfillment. And yet the bigger picture, the most important picture is that long-term one. And most of the things point forward to their fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. So because of the, the, the nation of Israel's sin, because of the wickedness of their kings, um, after Solomon, it split into two, and the northern tribes weren't ruled by the tribe of Judah. But the south was. There was always a seat of David on the throne in Judah in the south. Some of the kings were good. Some of the kings were bad. In the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, no good kings. Uh, most of them were idol worshipers and didn't, didn't follow God beginning with Jeroboam, their first king, all the way through. But in the south, you had kings like Hezekiah, kings like uh, Josiah, faithful kings. But ultimately, it came to an end. And this is a remarkable passage, Ezekiel 21. This is right, Ezekiel is prophesying right at the end of Judah's uh, uh, kingdom, uh, just before they were taken away captive into Babylon. In fact, Ezekiel experienced both those, life in Israel and life in captivity. And this is what he said. Speaking, of course, on behalf of, of the Lord, divinely inspired to write, thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem, take off the crown. This shall not be the same, exalt him that is a low, low abase him that is high. So there's, there's some sort of finality coming to this, to this kingdom of Judah. Uh, he says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more. Just a sec. David was promised a kingdom that will last forever. And yet here, Ezekiel, speaking on God's behalf, says it's, it's not going to be anymore. It's going to be overturned. It's going to be gone. Ah, but he says, until he come, whose right it is. And this is an echo right back to that passage uh, that, that uh, when Jacob said to Judah, uh, you know, until Shiloh come. So this is the Messiah. You know, who's going to come, whose right it is? We're going to see clearly uh, that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have similar echoes to that seed of the woman who would come, who would, who would bruise the serpent uh, on the head. Uh, we have, have Abraham being promised a seed who inherit the land forever with him. Uh, we saw last week that Paul in Galatians says, that's not seed plural. Seed sometimes can be plural, but that spe specific one is seed singular, and that seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're going to see this is the same thing. So all these pieces are going to come together in Christ. So in about 600 BC, 
uh, Babylon came down and, and wiped out uh, Israel, took them into captivity, and there was no more kings on the throne uh, of Israel until he come, whose right it is. And so we come to the New Testament. And remember, one of our goals was to see the linkage between the New Testament um, and the Old Testament. So here, uh, the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter one, again, turn up Luke chapter one, we're gonna be here for a couple of slides, incredible connections to what we've just been reading in 2 Samuel seven. So the angel says to Mary, fear not, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. See, Jesus was going to be son of David and son of God, just like God said in 2 Samuel 7, I will be his father, he will be my son. And this is then connected. So if you don't have it in your margin, write it in. Beside Luke chapter 1, you write 2 Samuel 7. Beside 2 Samuel 7, you write Luke chapter 1. These verses connect for us, old and new coming together. He shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord shall give him the throne of his father David. He's son of David, he's son of God, and he's a king, and he's going to sit on a throne. That's Jesus. And this is said of him before he's even conceived. This was a promise given to Mary. He goes on to say, for he shall reign over the house of Jacob, that's Israel, forever. This is 2 Samuel 7 language. Of his kingdom, there shall be no end. That was the promise that God gave to Mary, but it's really the same promise that he gave to David. There's a link here, although separated by a thousand years. Then said Mary unto the angel, the obvious question, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So he was going to be son of David. Incidentally, we'll see in a couple slides, Mary was a descendant of David. And he's going to be son of God. So this, this, this works perfectly for those fulfillment of those promises um, that, uh, that God gave to David. Now, are we sure we're on the right track here? I think we can see lots of echoes and connections as we do some effective Bible reading between 2 Samuel 7 and Luke chapter 1. But let's just say, well, what's the connection between Old and New Testament? Let's, let's flip our Bibles <clears throat> to, that, to that time when it becomes the Old Testament. Malachi ends, we flip, and we come to Matthew. What does it say? <clears throat> the very first verse of the New Testament says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it's interesting what we've got here in Matthew uh, chapter 1 um, is actually... Um, the genealogy of Joseph, his, uh, his stepfather, if you will. Um, he is connected uh, through David, right back to Abraham. Um, and that's the focus here in Matthew 1, verse 1. Now, as we'll see, Mary is also uh, a um, descendant of David, but not through the kingly line. So it's, it's interesting how God is working here. In Luke chapter uh, 3, uh, it says Jesus himself was uh, began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. This is actually Mary's genealogy. And how far back does it go? It goes all the way back to God. So we have here in the genealogy of Mary, uh, Jesus as the son or seed of the woman, going all the way back to son of God. So he's both the son of David through both Mary and his stepfather. There's a connection there back to the kingship. <clears throat> And he's connected to Abraham and he's connected to God. So these introductory verses in the New Testament of, of where Jesus came from and what the New Testament is all about directly link us back to the very promises that we've been looking at all the way back to Eden, all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to David. <clears throat> and Jesus is going to fulfill all these promises. Um, <clears throat> now, we are going to look at the promises to David more in, uh, in, in week four. So just a quick little summary here. Week one, we looked at Eden and Abraham. And we'll look more at the promises in, to Eden, in Eden, Genesis 3.15, next week. Then we looked at Abraham and David. And we'll see how that all comes together in week four uh, about a kingdom and a kingdom of God on earth. So 
We've gone fairly quickly over these promises, but in a sense, we've covered all the material kind of quickly. And then we're going to dig deeper and look in more detail the next two weeks. So hopefully we've laid a good groundwork for that. So what do we learn about this week? Well, Israel was a nation and a kingdom uh, in fulfillment of the promises to Abraham and then uh, to David. There's a throne involved, a throne of your father, David, that was promised to Jesus in, in the angel's words to Mary. Uh, it's going to be kingdom of God on earth. We saw it was here once under Solomon in sort of um, a, a prototype, if you will, a, a sample of what it was going to be like. But that came to an end because of men's wickedness. And, and so it was overturned, excuse me, it was overturned um, three times until he who comes whose right it is. And that will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus won't be mortal. Jesus is now immortal. He will sit on the throne and it will go on forever because there will be no sin. And of course, this key concept was son of David or seed of David. So seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, seed of David. We have this um, connect, connecting all these major promises through this idea of, of a seed or a descendant, an offspring. And of course, what we saw today that was new was that God said he will be my son. <clears throat> so he's going to be son of God as well. So God makes a covenant with all with Noah that represents all people. The earth will never be destroyed by a flood again. Uh, we have that assurance. And that makes sense because Abraham was promised the land forever. David was promised a kingdom forever. It's going to be here on this earth. God makes a covenant with a nation that is Israel. And we saw that fulfilled through Solomon and his, his sons, but ultimately the, the, uh, the ultimate son who is the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes a covenant with King David. So all people, Israel, King David, you can see how these promises are, are big picture promises, but also very personal and connected to us. David was promised a son who would live forever. And Jesus Christ is ultimately that son. And although the kingdom of God was temporarily overturned, it is here on earth and it will be fulfilled when Jesus returns. So those are the main things we've learned in this in this second week uh, to lay the groundwork as we look at the promises from Genesis to Revelation. We can participate in these promises because uh, through Jesus, we can inherit the promises to Abraham. And we can also be a part of this kingship because in Revelation, it says that we will be kings and priests with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these promises relate to us. We take meaning in them and, and we can understand them, not just as how they apply to others, to David and Abraham and, um, you know, to, to Jesus, but how through Jesus we can participate in these promises. So God willing, next week we'll look at the, the promises in Eden more in more detail, and uh, we hope to see you then. Thanks for, for joining us, and uh, we pray that you'll have a blessed week.